Hey everyone, it's Adam Farkas. Welcome to another OD Wire webinar. And before we get started tonight, let me just lay out the ground rules as usual. Uh, if you have a question tonight throughout the presentation, feel free to type it into that little question box on the right side of your screen, and, and I'm going to collect all the questions uh, for our speaker at the end. And I know a lot of you are interested in the iPad mini raffle that we're doing, and a little bit of change of pace today, we're going to actually do the raffle itself at the end of the show if we have time. Um, and if we run out of time, then I'll just do it right offline and put the results up on ODWire immediately. So so that said, why don't we just dive into it. And I'd, first of all, I'd like to thank the sponsor of tonight's show, which is NICOX. Um, and obviously, Red Eye is a subject that's near and dear to the folks at, at NICOX. Uh, and that's what this webinar tonight is all about. And we're very lucky tonight uh, to have Dr. Paul Karpecki, who I'm sure you all know, um, and I'm sure you've heard him speak before. And he's going to talk to us all about this new Red Eye protocol. Um, and see how you can actually implement it in your practice. And so with that said, why don't I turn it on over to you, Dr. Karpecki. Thank you very much, Dr. Farkas. Appreciate that. Nice introduction. You do a great job with these. I'm, first of all, I want to thank NICOX for the opportunity to get to present on this. I want to thank you for being here. I know you have a lot of things you could be doing. Um, here we are on a, a Thursday evening, so thank you for your presence. So let me go ahead and uh, begin here. And first of all, as disclosures, I am on the advisory board, consultant to NICOX. So um, fortunately, that's helped me to understand this technology. And really what I want to present today is much more, though, of understanding red eye. So, uh, well, there went the, that's all right. So learning objectives today are going to, what's the epidemiology and etiology of the various forms of infectious conjunctivitis? Going to look at the, how to differentiate adenovirus and apply key, key treatment regimens, which we didn't have in, in the past. We're going to talk about new technologies such as point-of-care diagnostics and, of course, the Adenoplus. And then how will this affect and adjust your future uh, protocols? So conjunctivitis is really the theme of today, more so than just the technology, even though I think it is important. And the reason why, it's the most common reason for acute-related, uh, eye-related primary visits. Fifteen percent of all pediatric referrals to Wales Eye Institute are conjunctivitis. And here's the big group. One in eight pediatric visits are for pink eye. Now, the first thing I think of is, that's a lot of patients. Number two, why aren't they seeing an optometrist or an ophthalmologist? I mean, this is really, this should be optometry's wheelhouse, really. Um, I guess we have to do a better job of telling parents that if their children get pink eye, going to the pediatrician may not necessarily be um, the ideal approach, simply because of the fact that we can manage all of that, and they may not have a slit lamp. And, and I'll show you today, we're going to think a little bit like pediatricians on knowing when a person should go to a pediatrician, we can, we can understand those times and, and make the correct referral, and all others we're going to manage very effectively. Now, the reason why this is also important is there, in all patients, including adults, there's a variety of conjunctivitis, and allergic is the most common, Then there's viral, bacterial, chlamydial, nonspecific, and even those that are dermatologically associated. Like when I think of chronic red eyes, I think of rosacea first. So acute conjunctivitis occurs in 6 million cases each year. So that's a huge number of patients as a percentage. And we said the three main types, allergic, bacterial, and viral. The fact, though, is that viral is much more common than we originally thought. We're going to talk more about that. And yet we've never really treated it effectively, meaning we didn't have topical antivirals in the past. Now we do have one, Zergan. And we do have some options for that. Allergic, I think optometry has done a great job. If I'm not mistaken, we're the number one eye care prescribers of allergy medications. So now it's kind of putting them all together and managing all conjunctivitis and being one of the leaders there. Now that's going to take a while because pediatricians are actually the number one conjunctivitis managing profession, but that's again education. Studies indicate that eye care practitioners make an accurate diagnosis only 50% of the time. And at first I thought that number doesn't sound right. I think I'm much better than that. Well, once I started getting the Adenoplus detector and realizing that what I thought was bacterial conjunctivitis turned out to be viral, I started realizing that I'm not much better than that, to be honest. I'm learning and still, and there's little things that I'm continuing to learn. I would say, though, we're probably a little better than that as a whole, but not as good as we might have thought. And here's part of the reason. If you look at the overlapping signs, redness, and then if you look at blue, that's bacterial conjunctivitis, and red is viral. The level of injection is very close. Allergic is a lot less. It's more of a glossy eye. Discharge is also very similar. Mucoid discharge is similar for all three. 
Uh, foreign body sensation is certainly higher for allergy, but the other two you wouldn't be able to differentiate. And again, that applies to watery, watery uh, follicles, and of course itching is all allergy, but the difference between viral and bacterial is always subtle. And that's what makes it difficult, meaning we're good at diagnosing allergic conjunctivitis. It's whether it's viral or bacterial conjunctivitis where the challenge comes in. That's why it's important to do other things. I tell, you know, when I'm teaching residents in the past or even when I'm doing it myself, I always talk about examining the skin around the face. That's for things like rosacea. It could be for a vesicular rash in a child who might have a herpetic, herpetic conjunctivitis. It could be for an adult who has lesions. In the, uh, in the upper forehead area and into the scalp and respecting the midline, which could be zoster. So any of those things can give us indications of what type of conjunctivitis we're dealing with. I also recommend you palpate the preauricular and submandibular lymph nodes. They tend to be very uh, prominent in viral and chlamydial infections. And when you're doing that, you really are trying to search for it. It's not a case of kind of putting your fingers up there and gently looking for it. You're really trying to rub in there to see if you can locate a little pea-side uh, knot. And ask patients, is it tender? That helps you a lot, too, in identifying it. Always ask if they have had a cold or flu. And then a fourth one, which should be up there, I don't know where it went, but is ask if they know someone who's recently had a pink eye or a red eye or whatever the patient wants to call it. But they will often say, yep, I had family members who had it. Transmission is important is a big factor for treating these. Do you know that EKC, for example, can live on anaminate surfaces for four to five weeks? Uh, it can stay on a tono pen tip for 24 hours Muted. And, and still be active. Um, you know, it can shed for 14 to 16 days after the initial symptoms and continue immune stimulus during that time. So patients unmuted back to work or school. And common modes of transmission include airborne, believe it or not, but hand to eye being the number one form. Symptoms of viral conjunctivitis include uh, redness. We all get these pretty good. Watery discharge, foreign body or pain, photophobia, decreased vision. But you know what? That applies to pretty much all of them. Bacterial also has the same thing other than maybe a more mucopurulent discharge. Uh, allergic has itching in there, but it still has foreign body sensation, sometimes photophobia. And so really there's a lot of overlap amongst the symptoms. The most common cause of viral conjunctivitis is adenovirus, but even then there's three different forms. There's PCF, or pharyngeal conjunctival fever. That's the only one that is associated with an upper respiratory infection. So the child comes in with a pink eye, and you ask, have you had an upper respiratory infection? Have you had a cold or a flu? And you look and you see that they have a fat. And then I would recommend that you all get a thermometer. I, I'm amazed. You, know, you can get these little tympanic ones you put in the ear, or better yet, you can do one that you run across the forehead. It's about $30. Parents are so impressed when I have one of my staff technicians check a child's for fever, and they think, wow, this is a good doctor's office. I'm not doing anything fancy. I do it on my children all the time. So, you know, it's, it's a, not a difficult thing to do in the office or have somebody do, and it just leaves a really good impact for that extra 20 seconds it took to do the measurement. And the tympanic and the forehead ones are less than 20 seconds, and that's what I'd recommend. So they have a fever, an upper respiratory infection. That's pharyngeal conjunctival fever. It could be, it would be positive with the adeno plus, but you have an idea now which form it is. If they didn't have a cold or a flu or a fever, then it's EKC, and that's the one we kind of fear. There's a lot of strains, but that one's the one that has wiped out clinics, as you heard in the past, where people are unable to have their entire staff get this red eye. And then hemorrhagic conjunctivitis, which typically, as its name says, has subconjunctival hemorrhages. Other implicated viruses in the viral world include herpes, simplex, and Epstein-Barr. Now, HSV we'll talk about because it is, although rare, it does show up in our offices, in children, the primary form, which is the conjunctivitis. The secondary forms, that is, they go dormant. Oops, let's go back one if we can. Let me jump over here. The secondary forms, uh, which is more like your dendritic corneal HSV, those are the dormant virus that occurs later on in life. But the primary exposure for HSV is in children. We'll talk about that. The worst conjunctivitis you will ever see is one of two. It's either allergic, as in this patient, or actually uh, the worst ones ever are adenovirus. I had a new ophthalmologist join the practice, one of the best surgeons I've ever seen. He's only 37. His name's Gary Wertz. Great guy, um, you know, to work with and a wonderful person. 
Well, I found, you know, he's not done a cornea fellowship, but he's really honored to get to learn. He's a great, great general surgeon, ophthalmology, cataracts, et cetera. So he'll, he came in and he said, Paul, I've got this patient who's got the worst looking conjunctivitis I've ever seen. I think it's preceptal cellulitis at a minimum. You know, what do you think's going on? So I walked in the room and I looked at the patient. Both eyes were almost completely closed like this. It's hardly looking through, swollen, much more red eye than this. This is just swollen from allergy, much more red. And I said, the patient's got EKC, and I walked back to my clinic. And he came back out to me and he said, you didn't even look at the patient. I said, yeah, the worst conjunctivitis he's ever are EKC. He goes, no, I think this is more serious. I respect you, Paul. I know you've done a lot of work in cornea for, you know, an old guy 20 years now. And, and, and maybe, you know, that perhaps, you know, you, you might be wrong this time. And I said, well, guess what? We've got this Adeno Plus detector. Go ahead and check it. If I'm wrong, I'll come and look at the patient. And he went and did the test, and sure enough, two lines, it was positive for EKC. We're not trained in ophthalmology or optometry too well about the whole aspect of the worst red eyes being EKC, but they almost always are. So it's also the worst condition to have after a week because of these subepithelial infiltrates that you are seeing here. It begins in one eye and spreads to the other. And that's important as patients. Do you have this in one eye? Did it begin in one eye? Did it spread to the second eye? It's also the eye it began in where you're really looking for those preauricular lymph nodes because it starts in the eye and the preauricular lymph nodes are in the same or ipsilateral side. After about a week of the disease, these immune corneal responses occur, which are reactions, immune response to the dead virus. Highly contagious conditions, we said it, we have all heard of clinics that have shut down because of it. And recurrent can occur in many patients. History of current contact lens intolerance. Um, can occur as well related to EKC. There's just a case here that we've used before that describes that. But adults and children can both get this. They often have a slight decrease in vision. Most other forms do not, even bacterial. There's definitely periorbital edema. Sometimes it could be the worst looking eye you've ever seen. They often see these small vesicular hemorrhages or subconchemes. Watch for those. And the infiltrates may not show up until at least seven days after the original acute onset. One of the best things is really the Adeno Plus for detecting this and has really changed the way I practice and that's why I'm glad to have the opportunity to present on it. It has taught me that I know less than I thought, which is humbling, but it also has taught me that to learn for other to learn about this, to know how to treat the patient, to be more confident in treating these patients. When I have a test that the parents of a child can look at that says what they have, or even a parent who's the patient. They are amazed. Uh, they, they don't question it. They do exactly what you say. You know, every other profession, you know, Dr. Farkas Adam here is a medical doctor. Uh, you know, when he, when he practicing medicine, when he used to, he could tell you that they use point of care diagnostics all the time. They will do a throat swab for strep, and the results come back, and the parents don't argue it because there they are. We don't use them as well. We're only finally now really getting into this. And I would encourage you to do this because it is the future. And currently, it's making a big difference. So if we go to this slide here. We see that it's kind of half coming in, half coming out. I think it's going to show you that the importance of kind of being able to test for patients ahead of time. Let me go to it. So our bandwidth has slowed for a second. Uh, there we go. It just showed back up. Two minutes, less than two minutes. Actually, it's about a 30-second test. The first thing you do is there's a little felt tip pad um, on this. You'll see it right away. Yeah, felt tip pad you put to the lower conjunctiva. Have the patient look up. You let that felt tip get completely soaked. You want enough tears in it to soak it in even though you're pressing on the conjunctiva. Maybe 10 seconds. And after that felt pad is drenched, you then place it uh, onto this little cartridge and you secure it down and you'll, feel it, you'll hear it click and you'll also feel it when it clicks in. At the other end, there's a little felt strip, and there's a reagent or solution in the kit, and you put that strip into the solution. And that takes another 20 seconds for that to absorb in. In fact, I recommend you keep it there until it's fully saturated, which I would say is, I would say I tell my staff 30 seconds just to be safe. So it took 10 seconds to get this test, one second to click it together, 30 seconds to get the Re, the, the strip with the reagent together, and then the patient keeps it with them in my clinic. 
and they do this on all the cute red eyes before they come in, which is something new, and I'll talk about that. And then it shows a 90% sensitivity and 96% specificity. This is the most accurate test we have. If this shows two lines, this person has it. It looks kind of like a pregnancy test, except in this case it's adenovirus that you have. It's completed in those four easy steps. Okay, so the next slide. So you've got it. Detects all known serotypes, every single one, including the hemorrhagic and others. It's easy to use. We talked about I actually have my technician do these now in my clinic. They love it. They feel like they're getting to do something new. Uh, very low cost. There's no additional equipment needed. It reimburses about $17 per use, so I don't lose anything on it. I gain a little, but mainly what I gain is efficiency. If I can walk into a room, look at this test, see two lines, I know what they've got. I can look for pseudomembranes, take them out. I could put them on Zergan because they have EKC, or I could do a povidone iodine rinse and send them home. And if I could get one or two of these one-minute exams a day, oh, they make all the difference in the world in my clinic. They speed up everything. I love it. Even if I got one line, I know what to look for as well, and I know to put them on an antibiotic if it's not allergy. So it's one-time use, of course, and uh, it's really, you don't need a lot of tears to get your effect. Six nanograms per ml. So the, dry, the red eye protocol has changed. In the past, what we would do is we would see a patient, we would determine what we thought it was, we weren't sure. We would then do the test. And I had a group from OD Lean uh, tell me that one of the best things a doctor can do is see a patient once for efficiency. That's the key. So you have to send them out and bring them back. It's kind of like doing two exams. You're better to see them one time, have all the information in front of you, and your efficiency will increase dramatically. And that's what this says. You identify it early. You do the test. Maybe even you keep them out of your main lanes because you know the answer ahead of time. You only have to clean the room that's involved. A positive test will be these two lines, red, blue, and negative test will mean one line. If you get no test, you didn't do it right. You probably didn't click the cartridge down. You didn't get it all the way down, and you get no lines. If you do it right and it's negative, it's one line. So read the results of it, and then test to diagnose adenosine, and then rule it out. So we just showed you this a moment ago, magnified a little bit better. So in managing EKC, consider the severity of the presentation. Um, early mild supportive therapy was the past. That's all we did before. We gave patients artificial tears, and they thought, why did I see this doctor? If you did steroids, all you did was increase the shedding time. Even though they felt better, now they're contagious longer. We went to daily disposable lenses for some. We kind of did little things. But you know, the truth is that now we can actually treat them. There's a study by Tabara that showed that Zergan is very effective for EKC. Five times a day for a week, followed by three times a day for a week. Two weeks of study, of therapy. The study by Tavera showed that patients on Zergan had complete resolution and were not contagious at 6.5 days, compared to 18.3 days for the palliative treatment group, those who got the old therapy. And probably if you put on steroids, even longer. Low, and the big advantage is here, low risk of subepithelial infiltrate development. I've probably treated about 20, 25 EKCs with Zergan. I haven't, I can't say I've had no SEIs develop. I have had one, two actually. One was mild and one was kind of normal. Maybe she wasn't compliant, but either way I have had two. But it is, does decrease the contagious risk. It does prevent comorbidity. Another option is povidone iodine, where you take a betadine rinse essentially that's used for cataract surgery, but in cataract surgery you don't put it in the eye for long. You just kind of clean the outer surface and maybe you put a quick drop in that you rinse out immediately out of the eye. Here you're talking about keeping it on the eye. My preference is Zergan. I, I see about 40 patients in a day. I don't know that I, I prefer not to take the time to do the rinse. I know that sounds terrible, but if someone can't afford Zergan, I will do the povidone iodine rinse for them because EKC is a brutal condition. If they can afford Zergan, I'd much rather just write a script and send them home. Plus, they love it. It's comfortable. It's about as comfortable as an artificial tear. Povidone iodine is just the opposite. It's the least comfortable treatment I've ever done to a patient. I had a technician in the building above us. We're kind of lucky. We have a, a great retina group above us, perhaps not associated with us, but the most, one of the most well-known in the world. They, they have John Kitchens. They have Tom. 
batted uh, Mosvegi, the first guy to ever do an Avastin injection. Avastin Palmer is now part of the group. Really an amazing group. So John called me up and said, hey, my lead technician has EKC. You guys hear me okay? Like a static coming down. Yeah, we're getting a little bit of feedback, I think, on your mic. Do you want me to try the phone? Uh, yeah, well, you know what? Why don't you turn your mic off for a second and then turn it back on and see what it does? Okay. Better. <laughs> All right. There we go. So that's perfect. Thank you. So anyways, John Kitchen called and he said, hey, my lead technician has got EKC. I know it's EKC because it's the worst eye I've ever seen. That's pretty good for a random guy. And I said, that sounds good. He goes, I, I need her back. I said, you can put her on Zergan. They'll clear it up probably four to six days. Tomorrow's study was six. But that'll be everything. Clears up the redness, everything prevents SEIs. He goes, I can't be without her for four to six days. I said, well, I can do the povidone iodine rinse, but she's going to be miserable. She's going to hate it. She's going to be in pain all day. She's going to dislike you and me. He goes, good, go ahead and do it. I need her back. So I said, all right, we'll do it. So she came down, and I said, so Becky, did they tell you what you're gonna, we're going to do for you today? And she goes, no. I said, good. So let's go ahead and put in some preparacaine. We put it in. We put another drop in two minutes later. When you got to numb someone twice with preparacaine, that's a bad sign. Put a drop of an NSAID in. Then you put in three drops of 5% povidone iodine. She didn't have any iodine allergy, so five, three drops in each eye. She kept her eyes closed for a minute, rolled her eyes around, then we irrigated it out with saline. And then we uh, put her on steroids and that NSAID for another two weeks. Gosh, it's a lot because of the inflammation we have now induced. And then I just got her in the elevator before the anesthetic wore off. And wouldn't you know it, the next day I'm in the elevator and she's in the same elevator. Isn't that Murphy's Law? So she looks at me and she says, I'm never speaking to you again. So that's kind of a good impression of what povidone iodine will do. But you know what? She had no EKC left either. She had no sub epithelial trace, and it was a pretty bad case. So that's the one good thing about it. It really does work. Now, if they don't show up for a week and you got all these SEIs, then you got to put them on steroids, especially if their vision is down. QID for a month, then taper slowly. I do QID. I do something like I prefer Lotomax because we're going to be on it for two to three months. But Pred would work too if you're checking pressures. But Lotomax gel, QID for one month, then TID for two weeks, then BID for two weeks, then QD for two weeks, then QOD every other day for two weeks. It's a long time. But I've found they rebound a lot if I, if I don't taper them slowly. Um, but, you know, if you've got to start steroids because their vision is 2040, then you have to. If you can avoid doing steroids, do it. Here's the povidone iodine, off-label, but it is used to rinse out an eye, essentially, anesthetize with paracaine twice, instill an NSAID, put the drops in, have them roll their eyes around with the closed eyes. Um, then after a minute, I irrigate it out, and then they get NSAIDs and steroids again. I keep them on the steroids and the NSAIDs, actually, for two weeks. And with that, there's no reports of clinical trials or adverse reactions that occurred in any of the trials. Just got avoided in someone who could have iodine. And I got to give credit to Tom, Melton and Thomas for this slide. They talk a lot about this. And it does work. I will give them credit. It really does wipe it out. Zergan, I think, is a nicer, more friendlier approach that also works really well. So in the next slide, just take a moment for the bandwidth here. Um, we have really a couple other forms, pharyngeoconjunctival fever. That's the one where you have the upper respiratory infection and a fever, hence the pharyngeal, hence the conjunctival, and lymphadenopathy in severe cases. This I would only treat with just palliative measures. But because you had a positive test, you know what's going on, patients do well. This only lasts a week. There's no SEIs involved with this one, and you can take care of it quite easily. Herpes simplex will be the same red eye, but only one eye, never both. it will be a child, it's the first exposure, and they'll have a vesicular rash, like a cold sore, but typically more vesicular rash around the eyelids. Just avoid steroids, of course, in the management of that child. Perhaps you could put them on Zergan or an oral antiviral like acyclovir, unless they're extremely young. Acyclovir in an 8 or 9 or 10-year-old would follow the adult dosing of 400 milligrams five times a day. Zoster, will that be an older patient? Here's a zoster eye. This person has lesions on the eyelid, the nose, the forehead. So we could tell what it was by looking around the face. The big, though, most common finding of HCO or shingles in the eye is iritis. So don't forget to look at the iris, uh, the anterior chamber, I should say, very closely 
when you have a patient who has zoster, that's the most important finding. 43% of all patients with HCO have an iritis. Now let's talk a little bit about here some of the bacterial forms. We already covered the childhood. We talked about avoiding steroids. And it's zoster treatments, oral antivirals. That would be Valtrex would be my preference for adults. 1,000 milligrams three times a day. And then strong steroids for the iritis, especially Durazol, Pred, LE gel. If there's no iritis, then you can just put them on the oral antivirals and the conjunctivitis will go away. Here's an interesting case of a 31-year-old gentleman came in the office with chronic red eyes and, S and subepithelial corneal infiltrates in a contact lens wearer. And as he presented in the office, he did have really red eyes. Wouldn't go away. It's been two months. What's really strange is you ever get a day where you don't see a condition and then you see like three or four in a day and then you don't see it again for a year? That's what happened. Two hours later, another guy came in, 29 years old, red eye for three weeks, and his SEIs, or his corneal infiltrates, I should say, not sub infiltrates, his corneal infiltrates were much more prominent. So I used his pictures. But literally, he was like three patients later. What do these guys have? Well, you can do the Adno Plus would be a good idea, but I didn't have it back then. It wasn't available. So you pull down the lower eyelid and look at those follicles. This was a case of chlamydia conjunctivitis. They have peripheral corneal infiltrates. No one ever talks about those in textbooks, but a cornea specialist taught me that once, and every time I've ever seen adult inclusion conjunctivitis, they all have corneal infiltrates. It's not related to the contact lens, it's related to this disease. Because it's so inflammatory, they also have a follicular conjunctivitis, and they have ipsilateral lymphadenopathy, same side as the first eye that began, usually preauricular. Now notice this person has a lot of blepharitis. That kind of throws you off. So it is difficult sometimes to make our diagnosis. That was adult inclusion conjunctivitis. Bacterial is another form that fits into a lot of groups. We rarely see hyperacute. That's Neisseria and other severe um, bacteria. Adult inclusion is in there, and tear blepharitis and blepharal conjunctivitis, even flectendular. I'm just going to cover the acute forms, which is the most common in children and most commonly caused by H. flu. It's the number one pathogen in children. Why is that important? Well, because it has a lot of other sequelae. The presentation is usually a red eye, but as you can tell, there's no difference in the statistics between viral and bacterial conjunctivitis as far as infection. And then there's this discharge that you look for. But even then, it's hard to differentiate discharge. And in children, you have to make sure that a child who comes in with conjunctivitis, that they haven't had trauma. And the reason I say that is two reasons. One, there's usually more MRSA involved in children with traumatic conjunctivitis, traumatic injury. And number two, in every child that you see in your clinic, you want to make sure you look around the skin or the eye for a kind of a redness, kind of a sheen, which can indicate preceptal cellulitis. So the old conjunctivitis toolbox is we diagnosed, we treated, they resolved or they didn't resolve, then we came back and did our adenopluses or our cultures, and then we retreated. Too much work, too much time. You want to know the results before you see the patient. Now, because of that, we use these broad spectrum antibiotics. And there are good ones. You want something that covers all of these path these statements we had here. But you want the strongest drugs. I always wondered why when Vigamox came out and Zymar came out, why do we use that for conjunctivitis? Because dead bugs don't mutate. Now it's Bessivance. Bessivance came out nine years later. It's a much stronger antibiotic. That's what we use now. It's the right tool. It's kicking out everything. And these fluoroquinolones are just more potent. They're, now we've got a chlorofluoroquinolone, which makes it even stronger as in Bessivance. And you can see this from the Armour study, that this drug has the potency in terms of killing 90% of the pathogens of what you would see with vancomycin, which used to be our big gun we used to save for the most severe forms. And we never had anything close to vanco before. So to have a commercial antibacterial that now works as well is pretty exciting, and that's been kind of the new change that has taken place. In fact, the Armour study actually showed specifically that. That's a study where they, every person who gets an infection, the bacterial isolate is sent to a lab. And there's 19 sites that do this every year, ocular centers, university hospitals, community hospitals. And they collect the isolates. This is the isolates they found. And then they take every single drug for the eye, and they say, how did it work? Whether it was 
vancomycin, bacifloxacin, moxifloxacin, cipro, tobramycin, etc. And what did they find? Well, they found that vancomycin was at the top, but it should be. It's real expensive. It's hard to get. But its MIC90 was not any different than Bessivance, which was eight times better than Moxie, 256 times better than Cipro. And that included a large percentage of patients that actually had MRSA and MRSI, the two bugs that we most fear. So it is interesting how we now have these. But the point is, if you have a viral conjunctivitis, you don't want to put an antibiotic on it. And you don't want to risk you know, using anything but the strongest antibiotic. If there's no bacteria, you still can build up resistance. That's how we get these fluoroquinolone resistant forms. And even for coagulase negative staph, the number one cause of endophthalmitis, the MIC 90s were the same for Bessie and Banco. Pretty powerful data. But my point again to this is if it's a viral condition, why even put them on antibacterials? And this is a high percentage of MRSA and fluoroquinolone resistant forms. And in fact, you're more likely to get resistance by using an older antibiotic because of cross resistance even to our new ones. So here's a child who came in, comes into your office with conjunctivitis. And you look at the eye and you ask, have you been in any trauma? Did you get hit in the eye? Did something hit you? And the child says no. Well, that rules out less chance of MRSA. But number two, it, it doesn't explain this red sheen around the eye. So in a non-traumatic case, why would you get a red sheen around a conjunctivitis eye? The diagnosis is preceptal cellulitis. Look for that in children. I'm amazed at how often that was missed by me and others. We have a pediatrician office across the hall from us, and I had a patient. I had I was treated for conjunctivitis and uh, wasn't getting better as far as the fever. Went to see the pediatrician, and he looked at the chart. So we saw Dr. Tarbeck. He's one of our really good docs, but um, he goes, he missed something. That's not a nice thing to tell. But nevertheless, the patient, he called me over, and I came over and looked. He's a really nice doc. And, he said, you notice this child's uh, sheen around her eyes? I said, yeah. He goes, that's preceptal cellulitis. I said, really? I probably have missed some of those. So anyways, after the course of the next few months, he would bring me in to see anybody who had this. I mean, I probably saw five or six. In fact, after a while, I said, you don't need to bring me in anymore. I, I kind of got it. And, uh, but I will educate colleagues because I, I'm amazed at how important it is to look for that reddish sheen, which is an indication of preceptal cellulitis. It is a common complication in children, not in adults. And the reason is because H. flu does tend to cause preceptal cellulitis, ethmoidal and maxillary sinusitis, and can even lead to other more severe things like encephalitis. So it's real important to look for that in children. Adults don't tend to get conjunctivitis from H. flu. So we also don't tend to see preceptal cellulitis that often in adults, but children do uh, because of the bug. Here's another example of the same thing. Obviously, that red sheen, a little more pronounced, is a preceptal cellulitis that's affecting both eyes, almost to the point of cellulitis. If she had pain on eye movement, we would have to make that an ocular emergency and send her to the ER for IV uh, antibiotics. But without pain on eye movement um, and no diplopia, that's a preceptal cellulitis. So here, referring when to refer to a uh, pediatrician or even a pediatric ophthalmologist, if they have a severe fever and you don't want to figure out what the dosing is, for your, your medications, that could be one time to do it. If there's an earache, they still got to treat that. Sometimes I just call the pediatrician and say, hey, what's the dose for a six-year-old? And they'll tell me what to put them on, like you know, um, amoxicillin or whatever. But many times I'll just send them over. If I see this reddish sheen or preceptal cellulitis that's in a child who I'd have to calculate the weight of the, anti of the oral antibiotic, I might just refer. Um, and then finally, if I have a really sick child, obviously I would refer that in. We have to look at the systemic in these. A few ocular infection pearls. Yeah, watch for preceptal cellulitis. Ask about ear infections. Upper respiratory infections could also indicate PCF, uh, viral conjunctivitis. Let me leave you with a couple cases so we still have time for question and answer. These are, question, these are cases I've had in the last month, so I thought it would really kind of shed the light on things. 31-year-old teacher, and then we'll look at the red protocol again. Um, red eyes for four weeks. No upper respiratory infection. She had lymphadenopathy. Well, first thing I did is I started asking her the wrong questions. I, I thought, when I looked in her eye, I saw a grade 2 plus bleph, 2 injection, 2 plus follicles. I thought, wait a minute. I've got lymphadenopathy. I've got follicles. If I saw corneal infiltrates, this could be chlamydia or adult inclusion conjunctivitis. But there were no corneal infiltrates. So I didn't know what to do at the time. This is right. We were starting to get the adeno plus. 
I looked at her eyes and I saw blepharitis, a lot of it, all through the lead margins. I looked over down under tear film to see what's going on there. I didn't see anything. I could definitely see a ton of blepharitis. Looks like Demodex almost because it's right at the base of the lashes. It's fairly clear sleeve, but it could be bacterial too. Then I look at her lower fornix and I see these big follicles. I didn't come out in my picture as well as I'd like, but there they are. I actually have two pictures. So maybe the second one's a little better. Yeah, it's a little better. You can see the follicles. Well, not great. Not as good as the last picture, but they, they were more evident when I saw her, and they were definitely follicular. They were clear and they were bumps. They weren't red bumps like papillae. So I started asking her. I noticed she had a ring, and I thought, well, I don't know if I want to ask her about her sexual her history. You know, so I asked her, you know, I noticed you're married. I don't know where I was going. I, then all of a sudden I said, wait a minute. You've got this adenoplast detector. I said, Lindsay, go get the adeno test and measure her. This was before I knew the red eye protocol of doing it first. And so they went ahead and did it. And I actually, I did it, tested it. And sure enough, it was positive, two lines. Thank goodness I didn't go down this whole chlamydia thing. I bet she left my office thinking, now, why did that guy ask me if I was married? <laughs> I, I was going down that path uh, some awkwardly way when I realized, Wait a minute, let's do this adeno plus. Now, now if this patient shows up, they get adeno plus first. I don't have to embarrass myself. I know if they've got two or one lines, I know which path to go down. That's why she had follicles. She had EKC. So adeno plus had two lines. Um, it was moderately distinct. After a long period of time, it gets a little more faded, but it still has that incredible 90 plus percent sensitivity and specificity. Positive for adenovirus, definite diagnosis. I put her on Zergan and it cleared beautifully. So now my clinical practice trip is to test first rather than go down the wrong potential path. I've oh, got a great little pearl from Dr. Friedman, a good friend of mine in Memphis, who said also in children and others think about uh, teeth abscesses. That is a great pearl. I've had patients who went to a dentist who then had preceptal. Uh, great insight, Mel. Love it. Thank you for doing that. I know you didn't want me to give him credit, but but I do appreciate He's a humble guy, but I do appreciate that. Uh, red eye with mattering in the morning. Um, this second patient, FH, white discharge. So that to me means bacterial. He had mattering or is stuck in the morning. It's been going on for five days, so it's acute. His eyelids were clear, though. He didn't have a lot of blepharitis, like the last patient that was adenovirus positive for EKC. And then he had hemorrhagic conjunctivitis four days duration. So I looked at his eye and I said, you know what, if I've got this level of conjunctivitis, that doesn't tell me anything. The hemorrhagic points towards being viral, much more likely to be EKC if you get hemorrhagic, but not of its own. The mu mucoperlian discharge to me meant bacterial, and I probably in the past would have done bacterial first. And look at the debris, it didn't come out great, but you can see the discharge in the tear film. I'll show you another example. Over, oh, there's more discharge. My picture didn't come out great. The system used by ODY is very good, very clear resolution, but my picture wasn't in very focused. But there's the red eye, and there's this discharge. So I thought, well, that's got to be what's going on. There's a lot of debris in the tear film. It's bacterial. But now this patient came in after I knew the red eye protocol. So on all acute red eyes, my staff do the adenoplus. And as I said, they love to do it. It's something new. It helps them to feel like they're advancing. And so what I did when I looked at this patient beforehand is I looked at the Adeno Plus because it was on entrance. And sure enough, there's one or two lines I know exactly what to do. This patient, I'll show you their conjunctiva here in a moment, it does have hemorrhagic presentation. And with that, you're kind of thinking, as I mentioned, on viral. It turned out to be positive for adenovirus. So that statistic that said that sometimes we're wrong as much as 50% might have been Right. I don't know if 50% is correct. There's the hemorrhagic presentation. But more than I expected. I've been wrong more often. Now that I have an adeno detector, this adeno plus, I find I have the answer when I come in, which helps with efficiency. I have the confidence of the patient, which helps with their belief in me and recommendation. And I know exactly which path to go in treating the patient and with questions. This patient had no lymph adenopathy, even though it was day five. They had mucoperlin discharge but it turned out to be adenovirus. And if I had to put them on SC Vance, sure, I'd have wiped out everything. But you know what? It wouldn't have got rid of the virus. The patient wouldn't have done any better. They might have got local resistance. So in this case, I could have done Zergan. If they don't have the finances for Zergan, I could do a povidone iodine rinse. Either way, I could prevent these subepidural infiltrates and perhaps help with morbidity 
greatly in these patients. So the key has really come to understanding new technologies, utilizing them in our clinical practice, and to then helping us to, as I said, increase efficiency, but most important, helping our patients do well with the right diagnosis and proper treatment. Great. Well, Paul, thank you so much. That was that was really clear. I, I can see why everyone always asks you to do these shows. <laughs> well, thank you. Wow. I'm still learning, but I appreciate yeah. that. And it is an honor to get to do it by webinar, um, for sure. Great. Well, I have a, a bunch of questions here that people have, have left for us. Um, and why don't I just go in the order of severity? <laughs> so the, the very first question was, what are the good orals uh, for someone when you have a preceptal case? The best oral, I think, is still Keflex, second generation cephalosporin, and simply because it has such a, uh, pre a such a predisposition to soft tissue. It seems to accumulate, and in preceptal, of course, you're dealing with skin tissue, which is soft tissue. I find that that's probably going to be the one I most often prescribe for these patients, and so that would be, of course, PO. I believe uh, Keflex uh, or cephalexin comes in a 250 milligram dosage and you can prescribe that two to three times a day. The other option, or uh, three to four times a day, I should say, the other option I think now they have is a 500 milligram dose. But I typically have done 250 milligrams um, for these patients and I usually do uh, three to four times a day, typically PID. There's a 50, 500 milligram that a lot of people are going to now of Keflex and they're using it once or twice a day for preceptal. I still go on the more aggressive front because it's preceptal. I typically, if I was doing the 500, um, you could do two or one. The 250, I typically would do three or four. Great. Uh, practice management question here, so a little bit off the beaten path, but if um, you know, you're using the Adeno Plus, how do you actually bill for the test, and what codes and modifiers do you use? Yeah, so this is a, this is a great one to kind of have in place. Um, so, you know, you do get reimbursed for this one, which is really important. And I've actually got the exact, had the code up there on one of my, presentations, but I'll go ahead and pull it up here on this so I give you the exact number um, of what I have. So it's clear waved uh, code. There's the PDF on this one. Um, it is 87809QW. 87809QW. So that's the Adeno Plus. Reimburses about $17. Um, in my clinic, 16 to 17, and then cost, I guess you'd work with the company on that, um, what their, their rate normally is. I, I don't even know, which is terrible. I know my staff order it, but it's less than that. It's not a huge money maker by any means. I, if I made $5 a patient, that's surprising, but it's mainly for the efficiency, for the right diagnosis, for the better medicine and the growth of the practice, but at least I'm not losing money. That, for me, is important. There was no reimbursement. I don't know if I'd still do it. I, th I still would just because of the huge value of it, but having a CPT code like 87809 um, QW does help a lot to uh, then offset the cost while getting all those benefits I described. Right. An interesting comment here um, about the psychology of actually using the test that patients really sort of like to see you do something <laughs> as opposed to doing nothing. So at the very least, the diagnostic test gives them something objective. Um, that they can hang their hat on when they're in the seat. That's such a great pearl. You know, um, Kelly Nichols, at one of the at an ad board I was at, she mentioned that she had some children that went into a hospital and they did the strep swab, and, and it was just the confidence in that. And they had sore throat too, the parents, and, and they said, you know what, we're having a little sore throat. Just the confidence in seeing a test made them say, okay, we'll also get treated too because we know that's probably what it is. And everybody, it's just you leave feeling like you've seen the right doctor. And... And yes, it's an extra little test to do, but if staff are doing it, saving me time, and the end result is I get the right diagnosis, uh, patients do feel the confidence around that. Right. That's a great point. And a question here, um, for perhaps for, for an office who has a little bit you know, smaller volume than you, um, do the tests actually have an expiration date, and do you have a sense, if they do, of how long they last? Yes, the tests do have an expiration date. Hey, Jason, you're not on the call, are you? I think it's pretty good length of time. Um, the expiration date. I have to go back and look at mine. I don't think it's a short expiration date, like a month or two. I think it's more like six months. And and um, the company's very good about that too. If you buy them and they are expired, they work with you. I remember in the past they did. I hope I'm not putting words in their mouth for them there of something they'll do. But they have worked 
me on some that they replaced that were expired, so they're they're very good. But the good thing is it has a long shelf life um, of the of the of the uh, test kit. I just keep them in there um, to have available. So if you don't have a real busy clinic, but you'd be amazed at how often for acute red eyes you end up using this. I went through 24, and um, well, I have three left in my kit, so I went through 21. I've bought two now. Um, in uh, from when do we first start? I guess in fe January or February. And I wouldn't think I could have gone through that many in my clinic. Because even it's a busy clinic, I tend to get more referred in patients. I don't get many conjunctivitis is referred. Up to our profession just does too good of a job managing those. So I think you'd be surprised um, that you will go through them quicker than the shelf life um, related to it. But you know, I know with the ninety percent. A sensitivity and 96% specificity. Um, when you do it, you know the results, and and so the more of these as you do, and these acute red eyes that are kind of coming in, the more you understand. So, result times take five to ten minutes. The shelf life is 24 months, two years. Um, I I assure you, you'll go through them in that time frame, even in a less than busy clinics, because it's got a great shelf life time, and and just just the numbers. And if we educate our patients well, which I, I think we have to do an even better job. I eventually see those, you know, I don't know how many thousand, how many million cases go to a pediatrician of conjunctivitis. We'll start going into our offices and then we'll easily go through those in 24 months. Wow. A uh, little question here, another sort of practice management question, moving away for, from the, the test. Um, the povidone iodine treatment. Adam, did all that come in? Yep, you, we got it all. Um, still there? And hopefully everyone can still hear me. <laughs> and it looks like we've lost Paul for a second. Adam, still there? Everybody? Ah, okay. Paul's back. <laughs> yeah. Are you there? Yes. Did everything come through? Or yes. No? You actually, your entire answer did, and then and then it cut out. So it cut out at the perfect time. Perfect. That was lucky. Thank you. Um, quick, quick question now. Um, is there any special disposal required for the test cartridge? Uh, not that I'm aware of. I believe that it just is simply discarded. Doesn't have to be in sharps. It's nothing related to that. The only issue is that you have a positive um, adenovirus. So, you know, when we do get a positive test, it's time to clean the entire room. That's why it might be great to know the test before you put them in a lane. It's time to use all your cleansers to get rid of clean anything they've touched or they're at. I would probably take the Adeno Plus because it is got the virus present there, gave you a positive test and I would dispose of it immediately. Um, but I'm not aware of, you know, it's not really human tissue by any means. You're not getting that. It's just tear virus. So I think you just, I think you have to be cautious because of the contagious nature of a positive test for EKC because of the virus being present. But I don't think there's anything specific to biohazard that I'm aware of that gets rid of. You do have a facility that offers biohazard blood material sample pickup. Then by all means, I would put it in there. But I believe that general uh, disposal is going to be is, is all that I'm aware of at this point. If right. I'm wrong, I'll send a note out to everyone. Great. And a uh, practice management question here about the povidone iodine treatment, the painful uh, procedure that you spoke about. Uh, is how do you, well? I guess two questions. Um, is this something that you can get reimbursed for? And if so, how do you actually bill for it? Yeah. So that was the code we discussed. So after you've done your visit, let's say it's a new patient. So maybe it's done nine nine two oh three, or or it's a nine two zero zero two. So a new patient comes in nine two. Wait a minute. Zero zero four. It's comprehensive. Probably nine two zero zero two. Uh, unless you dilated and all the elements to go to the four level. Um, so I would go ahead, 99203, let's say, I would go ahead and, um, you know, then add on the other code that we discussed. And typically they're very good about reimbursement on these, just because the amounts are fairly reasonable in terms of what um, they offer and, and because of the diagnosis. Now there are times that you may have to take a look with the, you know, the get ahead of time the advanced beneficiary notice with the insurance and kind of check on it because these are newer uh, technologies. But as a whole, I will tell you that um, they, they typically reimburse. So again, that code was, nine, it was 87809, and my exam code was a 99203 or 92002 more typically.
for a red eye. I usually don't dilate them unless it's iritis or something, in which case I'd go up to a 99204 for a new patient or 92004. Right. And a question about the 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 uh, iodine rinse again. How long do you actually keep the iodine in contact with the eye? One minute. It's a brutal minute. Um, <laughs> patients don't feel it because of the anesthetic, but that, that minute really knocks every, kills everything on the surface, and including the EKC virus, fortunately. But yeah, I think you, if you go, I've always wanted to do less because it's so toxic, but apparently you do have to give it about a minute, maybe 50 seconds if, you know, you could start rinsing. Well, <laughs> question here, um, do you ever give a refill of Zergan with the original prescription when you're treating EKC? Sure, that's one I don't mind. The only time I don't prescribe refills is for steroids. I'm a big prescriber of steroids, but I just don't want a patient leaving on a steroid feeling good, somehow got three refills, doesn't show up for six months and has pressures of 40. So that's the only drug I don't typically write a refill for. So Zergan I have no problem uh, writing it. I typically use it for EKC for two weeks and one, uh, one uh, prescription will cover that. But you know, a lot of people say, why not use it for the whole three weeks since it's a three-week virus? And there may be enough in there, but there may not. So I'd put down a refill and there's no issue with that at all. Right. And question here, how long do you actually recommend somebody stay out of school or work if they have EKC? Oh, wonderful question. Well, until their adeno plus is negative. Really, that's <laughs> the answer. Um, because it's a good test for to know if a patient's contagious. I had a principal of a school. I remember Rob Woldridge once lectured on this. I had the same situation. He was a principal. And um, he came in and said, you know, i got to get back to school. And uh, am I still contagious? And he had subepithelial infiltrates. So it was way past. He didn't know to come in early to treat them with Zergan, or maybe it was before Zergan or, or the povidone iodine rinse. So he had the SEIs, and I took out, now it's Adeno Plus. When it first came out, it was Adeno Tech. I took out the Adeno Plus now and, and went ahead and tested, and it was still positive. And I said, you know what? You're still contagious. So if you want to come in Monday morning before school starts, because it was like a third day, I said, we'll test you. And he came back, and it was only one line. So he wasn't contagious, and he went to school. But if you didn't have access to the technology, but we all do, then I think the answer is, unfortunately, between 10 and 14 days is the average time of being contagious with EKC. So if you made a positive EKC diagnosis, it's 10 to 14 days of likely being contagious to others. So it would mean more time off work than most people have in their vacation plans uh, or sick leaves many times when they're starting a new job. If they've been there a while, they probably cover it. So it's probably... You could risk 10 days, or you could say 14 to be completely sure, but that's the range. Right. You know, I can't help but wonder if this test might also be useful if you tell the patient, you know what, come back in a week. We'll test you again just to see if you cleared it faster than other folks so we can get you back to work or school. That's a great idea, Adam. I should have thought of that. That's terrific. I, I haven't done that. I think that is a good idea, especially if we know it's adenovirus because it does have a long course, and you can bring them back and, and test them. Now, if they're on... So again, a week is a perfect time because that's about when they're negative and about five to six days. And so I think that's a great, great idea. Right. Or even the end of the week, if it's a Monday, maybe it's Friday we test. It. Sure, because I think we all know people who get very edgy about staying out of work. <laughs> yes, and people who, who will stay out just because they, they don't want to risk others. So you get both areas where a confirmatory test would be very valuable. Right. Um, question here, and I don't know if we have enough time to get into it. Can you speak about CLIA certification in the test? Oh, this is an important one. I'm glad someone asked this. In order to do any point-of-care diagnostic test, you do have to be CLIA certified. And so that means you call the CLIA office, and they send you a form. Um, and this form basically says that you, you, know, uh, get, the, you get the waiver, meaning that you can do these tests in your office. And certain ones, and it is through, you know, it's for the CMS. It's the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, the CMS that, that runs this. Um, or at least requires this clinical laboratory, you know, way a waiver. So in order to do these tests. So you call up um, to obtain it. I think what you end up doing is there's a CLIA office, C-L-I-A. Uh, you get a certificate of waiver that's required. And they allow you to then use it for all of these. But it is... The FDA that determines which tests can be CLIA waived and which ones can't. So in order to do it, you have to pay them $150. It includes things like Adeno Plus, includes 
uh, in the future in Flamma Dry, maybe it definitely includes tier lab for osmolarity. Or, you don't have to get a separate one for each one. It includes every point of care diagnostic in that list. And so you would um, you'd get you could go to you know the FDA.gov website, um, and they will give you there's a list there. We put in clear of wave tests, but I just gave you them. And um, and so to enroll in it, you simply have to go to CMS. .hhs.gov front slash CLIA. So www.cms.hhs.gov front slash CLIA. And there'll be a local agency and they just have you fill out an application. They take $150 from you and you're good for about three years. Great. Um, and you know, and, and and that's you know, for right sites. Up. Right. I was going to actually say, just for, for everyone, who sound, if this sounds like a scary process, Jason Menzo from NICOX isn't here, uh, but he actually told me that if you call up NICOX, they will actually walk you through this process. They, they know uh, all the requirements for each state, so they can help you with it. So. I missed it, Adam, what you say there? Oh, I just said that if you call up NICOX, they'll actually walk you through the process of doing this because they know uh, for each state what the requirements are. Yeah, it's a great point. It's really easy. Everybody who's got an OD behind their name gets it. Um, maybe California, now with their new law, might. They were the one that didn't, but I think they were the only one. I think that has changed. And, um, and it's for the whole practice. But one site is covered, so all the doctors within it are covered, if I'm not mistaken. It's really easy to do. Right. And, you know, we'll post more information on ODWire about it. Um, unfortunately, uh, Jason from NICOX couldn't be here tonight, but we'll, we'll post more. Um, and, you know, Paul, I know you have a hard stop um, tonight in about three minutes. Uh, we're going to continue on after you leave um, with some right, ODWire. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm yep. going to have to leave you. I do have to give a presentation at 7, believe it or not, <laughs> um, at a meeting. But fortunately, I'm in the room, and I just have to go over to the other side. So I'm going to, with three minutes to spare, um, head over to do that. But I appreciate this opportunity, the wonderful questions. Um, certainly any more, if you can compile them, I'll help to answer them after the fact. And uh, Adam, thanks for being such a great host. And I want to thank all those colleagues of mine who took the time out on a Thursday evening to be on here. It says a lot about your, your dedication to advancing our profession, and I love seeing that. Great. Well, thanks so much, Paul. It was really a great, a great talk. And uh, an archive of this talk is actually going to be on ODWire. The video will be there within the next few days. So if you miss some points, everyone can go on back and listen again, and we can continue the conversation there. Thank you. Um, so thanks, Paul. So I guess turning to other ODWire business, um, <laughs> I know why all of you stayed, right? So um, let me get this out of the way. Before we turn to uh, ODWire business about guess the diagnosis, we'll talk about this offline since we ran out of time. Um, and before we talk about the, uh, the iPad mini drawing, what I'd like to do is let everyone know about this. So I have you here, so I may as well tell you. Um, we are in the process of launching a brand new service on ODWire. It's called ODWire Classifieds. You can see it up here on the screen right now. Um, where you can actually come and list any item that you have in your office uh, that you might not be using anymore that, that you might want to dispose of. You know, this is a very easy way. It's peer-to-peer, -peer, so the people who can see this are folks in your, uh, on ODWire. People can't actually see your name or anything uh, in, the out, in the community outside. Um, this is just for our members. The interesting thing is that we'll actually submit um, your classified ad here to all the major search engines, but it's stripped of your name. So you don't have to worry uh, about confidentiality. People who aren't ODWire members won't know who you are, but we're able to actually reach out um, and give you the, the widest distribution possible for your ad. Um, so the classifieds will have you know, all sorts. Of, you can look at the categories here. They'll have all sorts of equipment, um, as well as we like to list practices for sale, or if you're looking for an associate, um, or if you're looking for a piece of equipment, um, you can post a write up there. We made it very easy. Um, ODWR supporting members have actually been testing this for the past few weeks, so I think we have it down pretty well, <laughs> I hope. Um, and, uh, you know, we hope that this is a really inexpensive um, and, and for many listings free way to, to get stuff out there because we, we were really sort of dissatisfied with the options that you guys had for actually selling, selling optical uh, stuff online. Um, a lot of places were way too expensive um, where they just didn't have the reach. So if you'd like to come and, and start listing things, you can just go to odwire.org slash classifieds um, and, and list it. Starting next week, we're going to be marketing it more fully. But if you want to get your ad up there ahead of time, um, it'll have good exposure for next week. 
So now that my little ad is done, uh, the iPad mini giveaway, yes. Um, so as of right now, let me look. It looks like there are 104 of you left. So you guys are hardcore. And so what I'm going to do, <clears throat> is I'm going to draw a number out of the hat here with uh, random.org. So this is about as random as I know how to make a number. So I will click generate the number eight. And I will look on my list. I have a list of attendees here. If you use go to webinar, you'll know you have the whole list here. And I will count down eight from the top. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So Cheryl McKinnon, you are the winner of the iPad mini. Um, so Cheryl, uh, we'll be contacting you within the next day or so to get your information and uh, we'll go from there. So thanks so much for sticking around to the end. I appreciate everyone being here tonight. Um, and I guess this will be posted within the next three or four days and I guess I'll see you all online. So good night everyone.